hearts. Let's welcome him. Let's give him a round of applause. Brother Roy. Amen. Greetings to you all in the matches and the sweetest name of Jesus. It's my great joy and my privilege to be among you this morning time. Quite unexpected, but pre-planned by God. God never moves without purpose or plans. And we are chosen by God, not by chance, but by his choice. And I thank God for all the great things that God has been doing upon each one of our life. And I was really surprised taken by surprise when our dear elder who was um, you know, leading these, uh, uh, the communion service and he asked about those who have been healed and I think we all experience healing and we always walk on miracles every moment of our life. Every day as we breathe in, we experience God's miracles. We breathe in and breathe out. In the, in the, as the Bible says, in him we move and we live. Praise God. I want to thank God for this great opportunity God has given to me to come before you this morning time. Especially, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to beloved Pastor Tim and my dear brother uh, Tony, and of course his precious wife. I know that they both are the center of attraction this morning here. <laughs> and but uh, you know, in adjacent to that, I'm so I'm so excited to be here. When I saw him last in Chennai, in India, back in 2020, in the month of March, he was still single, but I'm so glad to be here, uh, meeting him as a family, and God bless you both, and may the Lord continue to give you much increase in every step as you continue to walk on. Praise God. And I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of you who are a sponsor of me being here this morning time. Um, it's It's a... It's a long story about my life, but I'm not going to take much time. I will be always on time. Uh, I'm used to speaking to the American congregations, uh, and I know the, the punctuality, so uh, that's fine. Don't worry, because Indians, sometimes they go ahead of time, sometimes they cross the line, uh, but I'll make sure that I'm within the line. Uh, I had a tough time at the beginning as I, I was first invited to speak in an American congregation that was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that was in 1994. I was just 25 years old. So the man said it was a, a special, uh, 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 it was a very unique ministry. I was invited for this. The whole service is going to be for 30 minutes. Uh, the singing, uh, offertory, preaching, communion, testimony, and including the benediction, everything have to be done in 30 minutes because that was the, the it was in the, the, the U.S. Navy uh, because there was a special force appointed by the U.S. government right after the Gulf War, you know, the 1991 Gulf War. So uh, that's where I met a great friend of mine. In fact, a, a man that I met became a great friend of mine. He was the deputy commanding chief for this uh, U.S. Saudi joint Air Force in the Middle East. And he said, I would like to have you come and share your testimony and message for seven minutes. <laughs> and I just cut it off in seven minutes. So that was the primary preparatory training for me, like how I learned to be in, in, in line. But when I go to the Indian groups, I always become quite liberal. Um, <laughs> but even while sharing this, it took about my two minutes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Are you happy this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. I was raised in a Syrian Orthodox Christian family. That's not that, that doesn't mean I was, I'm a Syrian member, uh, a Syrian citizen. You know, in India, especially, I grew up in a state called uh, the state of Kerala, the southern part of India, the state of Kerala. Uh, it's more like uh, what you call um, uh, the, the state of Pro Florida here in US. We have all coconut trees, betel nut, mango trees, jack trees, and, and most of the spices that come from Asia, by God's grace, they come from our state of Kerala, where we have a lot of, we call the, 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 the best diamond that come from our state is known as the black pepper. So that's a province I belong to by God's grace. Um, and this state we have, that's a place where Christianity reached to India back in, 90, in uh, AD 52 through St. Thomas. And I come from the same city or the same uh, county where St. Thomas anchored his boat for the first time in India. 
um, I had, I, you know, we have uh, varieties of uh, the Christian denominations in Kerala. That's the, that's the exciting part. I do not know whether it's a sad part or the exciting part. We have the Chaldean Christians. We have the Syrian Orthodox Christian. We have the Syrian Jacobite Christian. And we have um, Canaanite Christians. And we have this, uh, the zero Malabar Christian. We have Catholic Roman RC and, and Latin, Latin Catholics, Roman Catholics. And we have this Anglican, we call the Churches of South India, which is more resemblance to the, the Anglican Church. And we have the Methodists, we have the Baptists, so many. But uh, I grew up in the Syrian Orthodox family. I was consecrated, dedicated by my parents to become uh, a bishop, you know, as a celibate, as a bishop in the church. Uh, at the age of nine, as Pastor mentioned, I heard the voice. I was, as I was rushing in haste to attend the mass service in the Jacobite church. And on my way, it was about hardly one mile distance. And I was a hyper boy, so I don't, I don't know how to walk those days. I used to run. <laughs> as I was running, suddenly I heard a voice, but that was the inner voice. I never heard before, never heard after that, live for Jesus. Then uh, that voice arrested me, you know, still. And I just looked around as though somebody was speaking to me. It was an obvious voice. And it was not a female voice, just as I reported to my mother that since Jesus is speaking to me, then she said, she rebuked, no, no, it must be Mother Mary. I said, that was not a female voice, but it was a male voice I heard. And since then, I had a great hunger and thirst in my spirit to know the Lord and to walk with Him. At the age of 17, for the first time, in the same church, the Orthodox traditional, like the Coptic church where I grew, where I grew up, I, there was a convention during the Lent month, and I had the privilege of listening to the gospel, and there was an altar call, and I went, and as the preacher was, you know, asking the people, those who would like to come forward to be prayed over and sharing the testimony, please come forward. There was only two, and I was, by God's grace, one of them. And that's where I accepted the Lord as my personal Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, and I dedicated my life to the Lord. But I never knew that there's going to be a huge, challenging season awaiting for me. And almost two years, uh, I had to go through the most unspeakable uh, situations in my life because of my decision to follow Jesus. Uh, I knew that from the time when I came to know the Lord, there are many things that uh, the churches that I was part of practice were not in the, in the scriptural way. So I stopped praying to the other people. I said to my mother and my father, I will pray only to Jesus. Then that contradicted, you know, with, uh, with their uh, traditional practices in the home as well as in the church. Because I was, at the age of 11, I was ordained to be an altar boy in the church with all those white cassock wearing, with the priest blowing the incense. And eventually I was kicked out from the church and I was kicked out from my family. And in the later time, my parents, my maternal uncle, they forcefully took me to a mental hospital, uh, assuming that I am mentally ill. As they took me to the psychiatrist, the, the, that fellow, the doctor said, he doesn't have any problem, he is all right, except reading the Bible. So uh, make sure that he doesn't ha get a Bible to read. So they, 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 were, they were forcefully keeping me away from the Bible. And eventually they wanted me to... Uh, you know, you know, to put me to the hospital, but the doctor said he doesn't have any problem to be admitted in the hospital, but make sure that I give him some medicine to brainwash so that he will not have much interest in the Bible. And my parents were forcing me to take medicine. I said, I will never, don't expect me to take medicine. So they, they chained my hand and put my home for a couple of days. Eventually, I ran away from my home. And for almost two years, I was homeless. I went through the... the the most uh, difficult paths of life, working in a small shops, small grocery shops in s some other places. And almost two years, it was very tough to survive on, but the Lord continued to carry me through. In the meantime, my elder sister, she happened to know the Lord by God's grace. She was studying for her pharmacy training program in another city, in another province, where she came to know the Lord. And, and she... She knew the place where I was uh, working in, and she sent a letter to me that if you would like to serve the Lord, please come to this city. I met with a pastor. I will introduce him to you, and you can also join with him and do the ministry. 
And in 1987, in the month of November, I came to that particular city. I met with that pastor. For the first time, I attended a Sunday service after a long two years of time. And in the month of, in the year of 1988, in the month of January, there was a tiring meeting, which I never knew that it was a tiring meeting. And by God's grace, uh, I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it was quite surprising because I never knew a single word in English. I knew only the alphabets, and I knew hardly how to read a little bit of English. But when I was baptized by the Holy Spirit, I never knew that it was a tiring meeting because that was all announced in English which I did not know and the preaching of that pastor was in, uh, interpreted into the local language which was also foreign to me as the message was going on God's power fell upon me and he baptized me in his spirit and for the first time I began to speak in tongue was in English and today I'm able to communicate to you communicate with you the language that was gifted to me by God's grace it came as a gift from the Holy Spirit. When God deposited an anointing, not the language, but an anointing upon my life, I never knew that he had a, such a great dynamic plan concerning my life that will take me to across the nations. By God's grace, I'm crossing around 45 countries around the world. And back in 1989, by God's grace, my father, my mother, my elder sis younger sister, and my only brother, the whole family, they came to know the Lord. And in 89, when I was serving the Lord in the northern part of India, I was with a, a, a mission team, mission training program uh, offered by a team that is similar to Campus Crusade for Christ and the YWAM called Operation Mobilization, we call OM International, that was founded by George Werber from London. And I was going through that missionary mission training program in the northern part of India for almost three years. And 1989, during my prayer time, early in the morning, those days I used to read the Bible from 10 p.m. till 1 a.m. Then I go to bed from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. And 3 to 6 a.m. Uh, used to be my prayer time. And during the prayer time, the Lord showed me a vision, Saudi Arabia. And I never knew what I'm going to do with Saudi because I knew nothing about Saudi except my brother who was working as an engineer in Saudi. I did not share this vision with anyone, nor with my parents. And in 1993, I, when I was serving the Lord in Nepal, I got a letter from my sister stating that uh, your visa is ready for Saudi. I said, what? No, no, you got a visa for Saudi. Please come home. And 1994, January, I went to Saudi Arabia by God's grace. I knew that it's the toughest place even today too. And, uh, but I did not know what the Lord is going to do through my life and upon my life in Saudi by taking me all the way to this country. Uh, and because I, I, all what we heard was all challenging time, people will be persecuted, people will be beheaded on account of their faith in Jesus. But by God's grace, I kept on waiting upon the Lord uh, in Riyadh. The first seven days I fasted, nothing happened. Then I fasted for three days, nothing happened. Then I fasted for 40 days. And, and on the 35th day of the 40 days of fasting, God began to open the doors among the natives of the nation and also among the other Arab-speaking community by God's grace. And it was a turning point, a remarkable turning point in my life. And since 1994, the Lord has been taking me to across the nations through Saudi Arabia. And to 1996, we got married. And today, we are blessed with two boys. The big one, uh, the big boys turned to 21, and the small fellow turned to 15 yesterday by God's grace. And thereafter, the Lord has been opening doors for me among the close countries. Because in 2003, the Lord laid in my spirit when I was still in Saudi Arabia, I used to go and come back. 2003, the Lord placed in, laid in my spirit a special mission and also a great passion in my spirit for the persecuted countries around the world where they do not have the constitutional right. And that began to take me to many countries in the Far East Asian countries, including China, Vietnam, Hong Kong, 
Indonesia and many other nations in the Far East and almost except Pakistan, almost all the Southeast, South Asian countries and the whole Middle Eastern nations and, and to the Europe, especially to the East European nations. And 2005, um, I had the privilege to, to land in the US for the first time, invited by your former Senator Rick Santorum. And uh, because the US government heard about an Indian missionary who has been working among the, serving among the Arabs in Saudi Arabia, and a lady who was the right hand of then the time the Secretary of State Colin Powell. Her name was um, Elizabeth Colton, and she was the political desk officer for the US, uh, US in the whole Middle Eastern region. And as she heard about it, she said, I would like to see this young man. And she gave me uh, an appointment at the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh, and I had the privilege to go and visit her, spend about an hour and a half with her. And she said, well, this is something that I never heard from anybody. This is a very unique ministry, but I have a, a request for you. She said, don't, you will get, you might get, because of the nature of the ministry, you might get a lot of opportunity to settle down, especially in countries like U.S. or Canada or any other countries, but please, don't stop this ministry, don't settle down in U.S. I said, I will never do so, and I have kept my word even until today. There is nothing wrong in, I know there is nothing wrong in becoming a citizen of U.S., but it's all about the ministry the Lord has delegated upon my shoulder, especially in the eastern part of the world. And 2005, for the first time, I had the invitation by your Senator Rick Sandorum. That's how that's what actually brought me to U.S. to speak to the various officials on behalf of some of our Arab friends who were thrown into jail in Saudi Arabia. And by God's grace, they were rescued, they were released. In 2006, by God's grace, I was invited as a delegate to your White House uh, uh, representing Saudi Arabia. It was a special session which I cannot explain to you, you know, in public now. And thereafter, this... Uh, this great connection has been going on, irrespective of the administration that takes over in the in the Washington. That's something. Uh, that, that's that's something that we do. In, you know, in terms of uh, people who are thrown into jail, people who who are who are the our Christians who have lost everything from the countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, from Iran, and and some from the other countries who are seeking for asylum. Uh, solace to 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 settle their feet, and 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 this government, I tell you, you are so blessed to be the the, the, the citizens of the one of the most blessed nation on the earth, and probably uh, circumstantially, uh, uh, to make it more contemporary, when you when you consider the situation that you know the political issues that are going on, you might think that oh, where this nation is going to, but thank God for the foundation of this nation, the forefathers have laid. And I pray that this will continue on. And, uh, you know, I'm more excited about this nation than you are, because that's how the Lord has been using, uh, you know, the, the power of this nation to, to touch many lives across the world, and also rescuing many innocents who are thrown into the jail. And Tuesday, we have a uh, very incredible task to speak to the officials on behalf of some of the toughest issues that our brethren are going through in other part of the world. And thank God for all these things happening. To God be the glory alone. Praise God. That's all. So, um, so the rest of the things we will, we will, like someone says, that it will be seen in the scene or we will just talk in person when we have time if at all the time permits, but I don't want to consume much of the time that is given to share the word of God that, that has to bring glory to the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Are you happy this morning? Yeah. Can I go ahead to the word of God? Thank you, Pastor, once again for trusting me and sharing me, uh, sharing your pulpit with me. Uh, it's not an easy task. For, as an evangelist, I know we come and preach, but for the pastors, it takes time to build the church. Praise God. Thank God for your pastor. Thank God for his family. Do you really pray for your pastor every day? Come on. Praise God. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 
come on, come on. Let's give a Pentecostal hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Shall we turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 12? We are going to meditate briefly on the first three verses from the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole verse, but I just want to pick up a couple of things from this passage line by line. Chapter 12 is a continuation from chapter 11. Of course, chapter 11 is one of the most beautiful, encouraging, inspiring uh, chapter sessions in the whole Bible, which begins with the definition of the faith and Secondly, it continues to speak about the heroes of faith. In the original version, we call it as the veterans of faith. And in, I, I, I will come back to chapter 11 in a little while of time. But I just want to take you through something very specific from verses 1, 2, and 3. Ch verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses around us, then there is a clause. It says, let us, let's, let's get rid of every weight and also every sin that easily clings on us. And let us run the race that is set before us with consistency and perseverance, endurance, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you may not become weary nor disappointed in your soul. We are on a race. It is not about a relay race. It's a marathon race. It's not about who runs faster than the other. It's not about who finishes first. It's all about how do we begin or how have we began and how do we run and where do we run and how do we finish and where do we finish. God expects and he wants more than expectation. He wants us to have a glorious finishing than a disastrous ending. There are two chapters in the Bible uh, which is disastrous, so to say, in the book of Judges chapter 16 and 1 Samuel chapter 16 and in secondly from chapter 16 that is seen in chapter 31, the, the terrible ending of two heroes in the Bible. Although the ending of Samson was quite terrible, but God made it glorious because the last moment he became regret about his fall, downfall. Then he said, Lord, remember me just one more time and give me one more chance. And God did remember him. Although that was not the kind of ending designed by God, it was because his own choice. Yet God, it, God made it somewhat glorious. The Lord expects our ending to become more glorious. The glorious ending is not counted on the farewell that you receive at the earthly graveyard. It's all about the welcoming at the heavenly courtyard. You know, people count on the glorious ending when there are more people to give you a farewell. I'm sure in the last two years of time, th hundreds of millions of people, they never had a, a, a good farewell. Many people, you know, in, in certain countries, even especially our country in India, many people, and we all gone through those pains of separations. But we are after the one who had only two people to lay his body in a tomb, right? There were only two people to give the final farewell to Jesus, Nicodemus and Joseph. So don't expect anything more than that. If you get more, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. Praise God. So we are on a marathon race. 
this is not a competitive race on oh i'm running better than the other guy or i'm running faster than I'm, i can preach better than the other i can do better than the other no it's not about god did not choose us as better than the other but he chose us as different from one another and it says let us run the race looking unto jesus who is the author and the perfecter of faith author and the perfecter of faith and there are two conditions we need to oblige in order to maintain consistency in our race the first one the bible says let us lay aside every weight you know these both are mind related the second one the bible says every sins that easily clings on us that's all about the pet sinful habit these two things are highly dangerous both are mind related the first one is unwanted stuff that you try to hold on in your mind it's all about the the tensions the worries agonies sorrows and concerns that you try to hold it on in your mind it's not about laying all those burden when you walk into the sanctuary and when you go back pick them up and go back to your home no it's all about lay them aside lay them at the foot of jesus the bible says lay aside every weight and strip off every sins that easily clings on us and run the race that is set before us now i would say while we personalize that word it should be the race that is set before me it is not a group running it is an individual running it is an individual race praise god are you with me this morning praise god it is an individual race let me run the race that is set before me i alone have to accomplish the race that is set before me it is not about the duration it's all about how do we run and how do we finish our ending should be more glorious praise god now the bible says since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses around us cloud of witnesses around us that correlates this entire passage to the old testament heroes of faith which are mentioned briefly in chapter 11 the bible says the the heroes of veterans of faith now as you scroll down through each uh, the stories of these veterans or the heroes that are mentioned in chapter 11 there is something that will open up our eyes which i will try to bring you through in a little while of time now the bible says in chapter uh, chapter 12 verse 2 let's look into jesus one side you have the the heroes of faith who are uh, considered as the 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 um what you call the the uh, it says we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that's one side one side on the other side you see jesus but the bible doesn't say look unto them but the bible says look unto him they are not our role models but they are our examples praise god these testimonies these heroes of faith they are not our role models but they are our examples but the role model is none other than jesus christ let's look unto jesus there is a reason why the bible says look unto jesus alone when you come to verse 3 I'll try to paraphrase it a little bit more in details. In verse 3 it says, uh, okay, verse 2 says, look unto Jesus who is the author and the perfecter of faith. So now, reason number one, we sh- why should we look unto Jesus? He is the author and the perfecter of faith, which means he is the one who begins and the one who completes it in perfection. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 138 the last words the Lord will perfect that is concerning me. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 41 until 48 there are four times the Bible says God says I am the beginning I am the ending. When you come to the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 he says God who began a good work in our life is able to bring it in completion. The Bible says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 24 God who has called you is faithful and he will do it. 
and the bible says the book of revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2 the bible says he is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the ending which means in, in verse 9 it says in revelation chapter 1 verse 9 is it's 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 an inspiring passage in the bible john he gives briefly his testimony he says i john your brother the companion with you in the sufferings of jesus in the kingdom of jesus and in the patience endurance of jesus i was in the island of patmos because of the word of god and the testimony of jesus praise god and god led me through the in-depth of this passage to something that is quite unusual i just asked what is it john says i was in the island of patmos you know that i was the terminology i was is very unique when john says that's his testimony he says i was in the island of patmos the terminology the word called patmos means sterile or infertile you may plant anything it will spring up but it will never reproduce fruit that's the meaning of patmos even today patmos remains as a barren island it is a place you may try to plant anything it will spring up but it will never reproduce fruit that's a place where john was exiled so to say to to make it more contemporary that was a place of isolation and during that time of the reign of domitian this island was used as a as a as a place for exile as equal as execution once people who are exiled into this island it is a journey never to return from the island to the mainland once you are exiled you are done and there is no way to return during the time of domitian and apostle john was exiled why john was the only apostle as an only apostle who was exiled you don't see peter was exiled you don't see paul was exiled of course they are gone through imprisonment sufferings flocking you know uh, most excruciating excruciating scenes but why john uh, as an apostle of jesus why john alone was exiled others were not exiled there is a reason the reason why john was exiled is that the the the, the authorities the ru the rulers had made several attempts to put john into permanent silence they wanted to put him into an end but they learned something from this man the more they tried to finish him the more they tried to destroy him they found out this man seems to be an indestructible invincible man there is a secret which I'm not going to share with you now because of the limit of time. I just want to put up everything together like a capsule form. So they found out that this man cannot be killed. So in two ways, the, the, the rulers were upset in handling John. Had they left him alone, they found out this man will continue to influence people with Christ. If they try to persecute him, since he cannot be killed, they found out that it is too dangerous to test this man because even if you try to kill him yet he cannot be killed so the more pe number of people will turn to jesus because of this man so letting him go freely is a problem and trying to put him to struggles is also another challenge so they were sweating their head transpiring not knowing how to handle this man you know there are certain people like that hello it depends your calling and depends how faithful are we to the Lord. I believe it was just because of the strong determination of John. Who stood beside the cross of Jesus. While all other disciples were depleted. From the garden of Gethsemane. John, he never wanted to leave Jesus. It's all about how determined you are to walk with Jesus. And they found out this man cannot be destroyed. So the only way they could handle this issue was by exiling him into the island of Patmos. So Domitian thought he will never come back. His ministry is over. And I think as a human being, John also had thought while he was exiled to this island. It is just like a body that is taken from the sanctuary to the graveyard. That's how when people are exiled, final goodbye. We never have a chance to meet you again. So when John was exiled, in the human perspective, he may have contemplated that as though the era of my ministry seems to be ended up. Because all those who were exiled into this island before me,
they were all ended up here so it seems that the year of my ministry is over sometimes we also think the same when you when you encounter with some challenges hello when you face some hardships when you face some terrible situations that you do not know how to handle sometimes when you go through unspeakable pain when you are attacked by unexpected challenges impediments in your body or oh, seems to be how oh, uh, my days are numbered and same way john also thought as though the era of my ministry is over he never complained lord why did you allow me to come to this island um, but he thought the era of his ministry is over because people those who were exiled into that island had never survived from going from this island back to the mainland so john thought finish in in arabic where they say khalas khalas means finish but as he thought that soon i'm going to die the bible says his precious master jesus appeared to him in that island and john says as i saw him i fell at his feet as though one dead but he laid his right hand on me and he said don't be afraid you know that's the beauty when god speaks to someone you know when god conveys his message whether he conveys the message direct or through his messengers or prophets the first thing that he does is to take away the f- fear from you hello whenever god speaks conveys a message the first thing he does when angel gabriel came to mary don't be afraid hello when god spoke to when and the angel of god spoke to gideon don't be afraid god is with you so whenever god conveys a message the first thing god does is to nullify fear from you he says don't be afraid but the devil is just opposite he will try to plant fear in you hello are you all right i'm sorry about my different accent hope you are trying to understand my my indian version of english um so I, jesus said don't be afraid don't be afraid i am the beginning i am the ending in other word i am the one who started something in you and i am the one who decide where to finish and when to finish for he is the beginning and he is the ending when god begins to accomplish something in your life he is the one who began and he is the one who decide where you should finish your course and when should you finish your course you may face you may go through a lot of reports human reports medical reports and these medical reports are medically correct but there is only one report that can cancel all other report that is a report of god yes. hallelujah hallelujah and what brought elijah into the wilderness okay before coming to that point i will just bring you through verse 3 Verse three says, "Therefore consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary nor disappointed in your soul." Why the Scripture exclusively speaks to the New Testament saints, saying, "Do not, uh, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you may not become weary nor disappointed in your soul." you know have you ever noticed this is something that we need to be highly conspicuous especially in terms of the today's challenges you know when you go through the history of the old testament saints there is something uh, that that differentiates in terms of facing the challenges between the old testament saints and the new testament saints although it is not about all the saints in the old testament but majority of the old testament saints were seen becoming frustrated while they encountered with challenges some of them said lord enough take my life even moses said lord i pray thee take my life kill me lord elijah said in first king chapter 19 lord i am done take my life hello what brings elijah into the wilderness just because of one bad report hello 
in Psalms number 112, verses 1 and 7, 6 and 1, verse, verses 1, 6 and 7, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and who delights in his commandment. The next verse says, He will not be afraid of a bad report. Hello. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Now, what brings Elijah into the wilderness just on hearing a bad report? Jezebel. She had made a decree that in next 24 hours of time, I will make sure that you are chopped into pieces just like those, my prophets, whom you have killed. And you are going to be the same. Your fate is going to be the same in just one day of time. And Elijah, on hearkening this bad report, he lost his spirit. He, he became disheartened. And he said, Lord, I am done. Finish. In Arabic, I am done. Lord, um, enough. And he dismissed even his disciples with an assumption that the era of his ministry is over. And he kept on pursuing deep into the wilderness of Judah, seeking the Lord to take his life. The Bible says he walked almost 24 hours of journey into the wilderness. And he sees, as he saw a juniper tree, he collapsed under the shade of the tree with an assumption the Lord will take him. He said, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. You know, uh, that doesn't mean God listened to, God paid attention to his request. Although God paid attention to his situation, he did not answer to his question. He never knew that his major part of his ministry was yet to begin. Why many of the Old Testament says, you can see Jonah, he was lying under a tree waiting for the Lord to kill him. You know, you will come across not all, all about the Old Testament says, but majority of them were seen becoming succumbed to the, you know, the painful situation. Some of them said, Lord, enough, take my life. But when you come to the New Testament, on the second chapter of Acts, you see the birthday of the church. And thereafter, if you carefully study the history of the New Testament saints in the Bible, you will never find a single record in the New Testament where anyone had said, Lord, enough, take my life. Hello? I'm not preaching a wrong doctrine. Stephen, the first martyr of the kingdom, he never said, Lord, please take my life before I'm stoned to death. The more he was stunned, the more his eyes were opened to see. He said, I see Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Why the Old Testament saints were seen becoming fed up of life? Some of them becoming frustrated. Why the New Testament saints were not supposed to become frustrated despite being challenged? The Old Testament saints, they never had a role model to whom they could look into during their time. But today we have the greatest role model in the history of humanity that is none other than Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says, look unto Jesus. Hello. If you look unto Abraham, you might get disappointed. I don't mean to discount these people. They are all precious saints of God. If you look unto David, you might get disappointed. But look unto Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. Look into Jesus. You will never be disappointed. Those eyes that are lifted before him have never been put into a shame. Those faces that are appraised before him, lifted before him, have never been put into a shame. Those hands that are lifted before him in innocence will never return in vain. Hallelujah. So the Bible says, Look into Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus knew as each day, as he began his ministry, as he began his earthly ministry, Jesus knew that there is a cross awaiting for him. As each days were passing by, he knew he was getting and walking closer to the cross. Hello? Are you all right? Praise God. 
as each days were passing by jesus knew he was walking closer to the cross thank you pastor for the cross here and he did not choose anything that would divert his entry to the cross he did not choose any offer that would delay or that would distract his focus from entering to the cross he did not perform any miracles that would take him off from his focus on the cross but he gladly walked towards the cross hello because cross in those days of jesus was considered as a place of dead end once you are nailed to the cross that is a journey never to return that is a place where all your expectations come to an end that is a place where all your dreams come to an end that used to be the place where all your desires desirability all your dreams all your aspirations all your expectations come to stand still but when jesus died he opened up a new chapter beyond the cross and today we are greatly privileged to walk in that new way that was operated by jesus through his flesh hallelujah 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 now the bible says we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses around us witnesses around us if you carefully go through the witnesses in chapter 11 as you go through verses 32 onwards i'll try to paraphrase it little faster uh, to fit it in within that time frame understand the limitation it says what any more shall i say you know the apostle is trying to describe it in short he says what any more shall i say for the time would fail me to tell about gideon samson jephthah david and prophets like samuel and he continues on he says through faith they conquered the nations hello through faith from verses 32 onwards the holy spirit is now classifying the old testament saints into two major sect classifying them into two classes the first group he says in verse 32 it says through faith they conquered the nations they administered justice and they obtained the promises and they shut the mouths of lion and they extinguished the 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 the, the power of the fire extinguished the flame of the fire and escaped from the edges of the sword and they out of their weaknesses were made strong and they became valiant in battle and had driven out foreign armies and some of their women received the dead raised to life but others hello let's pay careful attention to the next line he says but others it says they were tortured until death not accepting deliverance for they knew there will be a better resurrection and it continues on some of them were stoned to death some of them were sawn asunder they were they were killed by the sword they were afflicted they were chained they were thrown into prison and some of them they wandered in the sheep skin and goat skin and they lived in the tents lived in the dens and the caves and the poles of the earth and the world was not worthy of them but when we speak about the first group it says they they conquered the nation they administered justice they extinguished they quenched the violence of fire escaped from the edges of sword and they shut the mouths of lions so when you go through those passages it brings us into the remembrance of the names of those saints we suddenly begin to remember about okay extinguish the violence of fire we understand those hebrew boys they shut the mouths of lions we understand people like daniel so it comes to our mem- remembrance of of whom it speaks about you know it it points to certain people but as you go through the this next sect of the saints of god it doesn't mention about the names hello others it says others hello others were tortured to death not accepting deliverance now when i share this second part the, about the, the 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 details of the second sect of the saints of god 
it is very much connected to the people that I'm, I'm associated with in the Middle Eastern nations. They were tortured until death. They were given, the persecutors had given them two options, either to embrace the, the faith of their persecutors and deny their faith, or embrace death and finish. But the Bible says they were tortured until death. In other words, they were, uh, you know, there is an old English statement, do not settle with anything less than God's will. So they refused to settle, they refused to compromise. They refused to, they refused to be delivered by accepting a ransom. Probably they were given better options. You will enjoy a better life. You will get promotions. You will get elevations in your business. You can enjoy a better life. You will get an extension of life if you deny your faith. But if you do not deny your faith, all your dreams are going to be finished. You will die soon. But the Bible says they have tortured to death, not accepting deliverance at the expense of the cross. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Which means, you know, others, and, and the Bible continues on, yet some others, they were afflicted. They were sown asunder. They were killed by the sword. They were afflicted. They were tempted. They were thrown into the prison. They had to, they were wrapped up with their goat skin and sheep skin. And I, I don't want to explain the whole thing. Sometimes some people might get even, you know, traumatized when I share about the goat skin and sheep skin. But the names, we, don't know, we do not know who, about whom it is talking about. Which means, there are two types of heroes. One side, they are well known. The other side, they are unknown. But they were all well done. Hallelujah. So it's not about whether you are well known or unknown. It's all about how well done are we going to be. God expects our Ending to become well done. Well done. Praise God. The first sect of saints of God. The first sect of the saints of God. They conquered the nation. But the second sect, they lost their nation. The first one, they administered justice. But the second group, they were denied justice. The first group, they quenched the violence of fire. But the second one, they were burned alive in the fire. The first group... They escaped from the edges of sword, but the second group, they were killed by the sword. The first group, they became mighty in battle, but the second group, they lost in the battle. But don't, do not count all the loss are the loss of faith. Hello? Sometimes you will accept certain losses in the life so that you will never lose the faith. That is what Christian life is all about. They were defeated, but they were not defeated in faith. They accept the defeat so that they will not be defeated in faith. So the first group, they became valiant in battle. But the second group, they, they lost in their battle. Yet they did not lose their faith. Praise God. So that's how you see, which means there are two types of trials of faith. The trials of temptations and the trials of tribulations. It, I'm not talking about the tribulation that is yet to come, but the contemporary tribulations. Praise God. There are two types of trials. Trials of temptations and trials of challenges and trials of tribulations. But both are equally important in terms of understanding. But these saints of God, the higher they have gone in their life, because the first group, they enjoyed the elevations of position. Some of them were kings. Some of them were priests. Some of them were prophets. Some of them were, you know, the, the chief of the army. Some of them were noblemen. They all enjoyed. Some of them were even judges. They all enjoyed great positions. But others, they, you know, they were experiencing a lowness in their life. One group, they have gone, experienced everythingness. The others had gone through nothingness. Which means they experience nothing. They lost everything. Others gain everything. In other words, your faith is being tested both in your gain and in your pain. Praise God. Yet we should not compromise. The higher, go in, the higher you may go in your life, the higher are the chances to become ignorant of God. Because, you know, 
the lower you go in the life, the greater are the possibilities to become doubtful of God. Why God? Why these things happen? You know, when you lose everything, majority of us, we, 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 we kneel down and we pray and spend time in prayers, asking the Lord's guidance, direction, Lord, why God? Why? And we pray for one hour, two hours, three hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. We fast for three days, seven days, 21 days, 40 days. Until the doors are open, we become so adamant to get the doors open. But when everything goes all right, when the doors are open, those three hours of prayer become three minutes of prayer. Hello? Uh, the five hours of prayer become five minutes of prayer. And hardly we have a family prayer. Hardly we spend time in our personal prayer. When we had nothing, we had enough time to read the Bible. But when we have everything, we hardly read the Bible. Hello? I'm sorry, I'm not pointing to anyone. I'm just telling in the general perspective. And you may accept it if you are so. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the higher you go in the life, you, may, you might, some people think that when you go high in the heights of life, the spiritual life is super. No. If you ask those people, those who are in those positions, they will tell you how difficult it is to balance spirituality when you are in the heights of life. The higher you go, the higher you are compelled to compromise. Yet, praise God, for the sake of our integrity with God, we never compromise. The lower you go in the life, the lower you are going through painful scenarios in the life. And you will be forced to compromise. You will become doubtful. Yet you do not compromise. You know, even in the midst of nothingness, you find joy. For the Bible says, even though... I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death, yet I will find no, I will fear no evil. So darkness does not mean the absence of God's presence. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says that the darkness was there on the face of the earth, but the Spirit of the Lord was still hovering on it. So darkness does not mean God is not doing anything. Something is still happening. Hallelujah. My sisters and brothers, if you are experiencing such scenarios in your life, do not become disheartened. Do not lose hope. Continue to pay attention to the Lord. Do not look around. When you look at certain people, you might become disappointed. But if you look unto Jesus, the perfect personality who had ever walked upon this planet, who is worthy to be worshipped, worthy to be imitated, that is none other than Jesus Christ. So the Bible says, Cast your eyes, fix your eyes upon Jesus. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Endurance is the hallmark of Christian life. Endured the cross, despising the shame of the cross, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Therefore consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you may not become disappointed. Do not give in to disappointment. We will face disappointment. We might face challenges. We might face frustration. But do not give in to frustration. Because we have Jesus, one who has conquered this world. Jesus said, I have overcome this world. Hallelujah.